This is the story of Ariana Afghan, Flight 701. On the 5th of January, 1969, a Boeing 727 was making the long trip from Kabul to London. Now, I say long trip because the trip itself wasn't too long. But the plane had to make a lot of stops in between before it even got to London. It had stops at Kandahar, Beirut, Istanbul, and Frankfurt. While on the ground at Beirut, the plane was taken over by a new crew who would fly the plane all the way to London. By midnight on the 5th of January 1969, the plane was on the ground in Frankfurt, and the crew were making preparations for the final leg of the flight. Since the weather at London's Gatwick Airport was a bit iffy, they said Stansted as their planned alternate. This made sense since weather reports at the time put visibility at Gatwick at 100 meters or 328 feet, while the visibility at Stansted was 2 kilometers or 1.24 miles. The worst thing was that the visibility was not expected to improve until 6 a.m. So, for now at least, a thick blanket of fog covered London Gatwick. The captain of Flight 701 did not want to delay things too much, so he decided to take off, but not before taking on enough fuel so that he could return to Frankfurt if needed. With the weather on their minds, Flight 701 took off, and as they cruised, they got weather reports after weather report telling them the same thing over and over again. The visibility at Gatwick was stuck at 100 with no sign of improving anytime soon. As the plane approached London, the captain made his intention to land at Gatwick clear, and the controllers let him know that runway 27 was the one in use. Now, the captain knew that the weather would be bad, so he also got permission to divert to Heathrow if necessary. At 1.27 a.m., the plane was at 5,000 feet and streaking towards a radio beacon called Mayfield. This beacon signaled the start of the Gatwick control zone. As soon as Flight 701 overflew the beacon, the controller cleared the plane down to 2,000 feet. It was given vectors to intercept the ILS of runway 27 at Gatwick. The ILS, or the instrument landing system, is a beacon that the plane can follow right down to the runway. In the cockpit, the pilots were busy with checklists and their go-around procedures. They told the controller at Gatwick that if they were to go around, they'd maintain the runway heading and then proceed to Heathrow. This is all very standard stuff. At 1.31am, the 727 was 8 miles from the runway and the plane was holding its altitude, waiting to intercept the ILS beacon beam from below. The ILS would take the plane through the fog and right down to the runway. ATC came on the radio letting the pilots know about the wind and visibility, important parameters given the conditions outside. As the controller did that, he glanced at the radar scope. He could see that Flight 701 was right on the extended center line, right where he wanted them to be. In the cockpit, the captain asked the first officer to look for a warning light that had come on during the landing in Frankfurt. Once they had set their speeds for this landing, the first officer called attention to a red light that they could see through the fog and darkness. The captain identified this as the lights at the far end of the runway. But he was wrong. That was a light on Russ Hill. As soon as they noticed the red light, the plane intercepted the glide slope and began its descent. The pilots felt the nose drop as the plane began its descent. Seconds later, the pilots got a stabilizer out of trim warning, exactly like the one they had gotten when they were landing at Frankfurt. The flight engineer warned the captain that the nose was being trimmed down excessively by the autopilot. Annoyed by this, the captain disengaged the autopilot and manually trimmed the plane nose up just a bit and continued with the approach. As Flight 701 passed the outer marker, the captain called for flaps 30, and the first officer did as the captain asked. Unknown to them, though, the airplane was descending faster than any of them realized. They expected the plane to be at about 700 feet per minute of descent, but they were actually dropping at about 1,000 feet per minute. When the first officer called out an altitude of 400 feet, the captain knew that something was wrong. They should not have been this low when they were so far away from the runway, so the captain immediately trimmed the nose of the plane all the way up. But the plane did not seem to respond. The nose of the plane seemingly wanted to go down and not up. Both pilots were now pulling back on the yoke with all their might. 
the captain applied full power as a last-ditch attempt to save the airplane. But, despite their best efforts, the plane started impacting the tops of the trees. The plane was so low that it knocked the chimney right off a house. But their actions weren't enough. The plane came down in a field after colliding with a tree, and it went on to impact a house that was in that field. Of the 62 people on board, only 14 people survived. The two occupants of the house were also killed, but their infant survived. When a plane crashes short of the runway in bad weather, the first question that you ask yourself is, should they have been landing in weather that bad? At the time of the accident, the RVR, or the runway visual range, was 100 meters or 328 feet. Pilots of British registered aircraft were not allowed to attempt a landing if the RVR value was below the minima for a particular approach. In this case, the minima for this approach was well above 100 meters. So if Flight 701 was a British registered aircraft, this landing would have been against regulations. But the thing is, that particular regulation did not extend to foreign airlines. So this landing was fair game. But there's another thing to consider, the airline's operations manual. Ariana Afghan's operations manual forbade pilots from landing when the RVR was less than the minima for a runway. But it gave the captain the option of descending down to the minimum safe altitude if the captain so desired. What all that says is that the captain was well within his right to attempt a landing, but he was not allowed to descend below 200 feet without having the runway in sight. And given where the plane ended up, it's clear that this crew never sighted the runway on their approach. This type of weather was known to give a hard time to even the most experienced pilots, and it looks like the weather got the best of the crew of Flight 701. At least, that's what it looked like until the investigators started looking at the flight data of the 727. When the jet was 15 miles from the runway, everything looked exactly the way it should be. The plane was configured correctly, and everything seemed to be going smoothly. But when the plane was 6 miles away at 1,800 feet, things started to go wrong for the crew of Flight 701. The speed readout was not what the investigators were expecting. For example, once Flap 15 had been selected, the speed went down to 143 knots. But once the landing gear was extended, the speed spiked to 176 knots. Now that's way too fast for Flaps 15. Someone in the cockpit was in managing power correctly. That wasn't all. The data showed that once the plane had intercepted the glide slope, the autopilot had to really push the nose down further than usual, and the ensuing descent was faster than normal. Running the numbers, they came to the shocking conclusion that the flaps had not been set correctly. You see, at that point, during the descent, the flap should have been at at least 20 degrees, but they were still at 15 degrees. This meant that there was less drag on the plane than there should have been. This in turn meant that the autopilot was working overtime to keep the plane on the correct descent path. When the nose dropped, the speed increased more than usual because there wasn't enough drag on the plane to really slow it down. So this increased speed caused even more lift which in turn made the autopilot work even harder to keep the plane on the correct glide path. This vicious cycle continued for a while until the autopilot was at its limits. That's when they got the stabilizer out of trim warning. The autopilot was essentially telling them that it couldn't fly the plane the way the pilots wanted it to. But the pilots never picked up on what was wrong. They just assumed that there was something wrong with the trim system on the jet. So. At that point, the plane is struggling to descend, and it has too much lift. How does a plane that has too much lift and too much speed crash into a field and then a house? What happened next in the cockpit sent the plane to the other end of the energy curve. As the jet passed through 1500 feet, the engines were pulled back to idle, and at the same time the flaps were extended from 15 degrees all the way to 30 degrees. The pilot skipped all of the intermediate flap extension steps. This continuous 15 degree flap extension increased the drag on the plane considerably and coupled with the engines at idle, the rate of descent started to go up. But no one in the cockpit noticed. This plane needed more power now more than ever, but no one gave it any. 
and so it started to drift below the glide slope. In fact, at this point, due to the low power setting and the flaps being at 30, Flight 701 was descending at 1,200 to 1,400 feet per minute, which is twice the recommended rate of descent for an approach like this. As the plane slid into dangerous territory, the attention of the pilots were probably focused on their surroundings. They might have been peering into the foggy night looking for any sign of the runway. No one paid any attention to the instruments in the cockpit that could have told the pilots that they were in danger. When they did realize that something was wrong, they were 300 feet off the ground, and it took the captain six seconds to realize what was happening and to react. In those six seconds, the plane descended by another 120 feet. By the time the captain commanded max power, it was too late. The plane was too far gone. The accident was inevitable. But there's one final piece that we need to understand to get the whole story behind Ariana Afghan Flight 701. We need to look at the pilots. The captain and the first officer were both experienced pilots. The captain had 10,400 hours of flying under his belt, and the first officer had 3,200 hours of flying. But for both pilots, they had only recently started flying jets. The captain had 500 hours on the 727, and the first officer had 210 hours. This inexperience manifested itself in the cockpit. The pilots were flying the jet like a piston engine aircraft. In a jet, there is a clear demarcation of duties. One pilot flies while the other monitors. I mean, that is present in all forms of aviation. But in a slower piston engine aircraft, there's more margin to recover from an error. The investigators found out that the captain would carry out duties on the flight deck instead of focusing on flying the plane and the first officer was weak at instrument cross-checks and often forgot checklists. Now, these were issues that were seen in many pilots who transitioned from piston engine aircraft to jet airplanes like the 727. Their lack of expertise was the final factor in the crash of Ariana Afghan Flight 701. In the end, just messing up the order in which the flaps came out was enough to crash this plane. They didn't forget the flaps, they were just a bit late with the flaps. Just goes to show you that sometimes even the smallest things can turn catastrophic. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will talk to you guys next time. Stay safe.